welcome once again to this week's edition of Travel World 95. I'm Stephen Pickford. New England, so close to home, yet so undiscovered. The very words conjure up those romantic images of covered bridges, a stroll on a moonlit beach, some country inns. What are the ideal places to visit in New England, away from the hustle and bustle of the traditional getaway spots? We'll learn more later when Manny Witt of the New England Tourism Center drops by to share some of his insights. But first, what are the rights and obligations of the traveler when he or she goes away? We've all heard horror stories about those trips from hell. How can we avoid them? What to do when they do occur? It's a privilege and an honor to be joined today in studio by one of Canada's foremost experts in the field of travel law, Paul Unterberg. Welcome to Travel World. Hi, Stephen. I'm glad you could come by and join us. Uh, now, Quebec, Ontario, BC, basically the three provinces that have consumer legislation in place, particularly with regards to travel. How does this protect the traveler in actual practice? Those uh, three provinces which have travel agents acts that uh, specifically legislate um, what a travel agent has to do to be a travel agent and so on, all three of them require an agent's permit. He cannot get that permit uh, without filing proper security and he cannot operate without the permit. So that means that any traveler who buys from a registered agency here, and they all have to be registered, knows that if there's a problem he can go to court, get a judgment, and he won't have one of those judgments you can nail to the wall and you can't execute. Right. He'll, he'll know that he can, he can uh, be repaid and reimbursed for the damages to which he's entitled. So that our recommendation is obviously never to deal with someone unless you're sure that he's got a permit. And uh, second of all, when you're dealing with an out-of-province supplier, regardless of where it is, California or wherever, be very, very careful because there you're not covered. You're, he hasn't got a Quebec permit and you're not covered on it. Right, because a lot of people will see an advertisement in a newspaper, it sounds like a good deal, send your money, call them up, maybe even a company that they've heard of, like it's a wholesaler or whatever, that they have seen, been in business for many years, but those companies just as easily can go to business. And it doesn't, uh, we're, I'm not necessarily talking about fly-by-nights, I'll give you an example. Uh, we were involved in a case a few months ago where some Quebecers bought uh, a package from a California tour operator, a big California tour operator, been in business for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. Two weeks before, the, they paid their money, about 10 grand, trip to India. Two weeks before they were supposed to leave, the California operator goes under, goes bust. And those people lost all their money. They went to court and they sued and they weren't, the judge said, uh-uh, he didn't have a permit, you're out. Now, how does somebody go about finding out whether the person they are dealing with really has a permit? Or in the case of some uh, supplier in the United States, puts his funds in an escrow account or follows whatever legislation is pertinent to their particular state. I don't believe that there's real protection if you're buying out of province uh, product coming for instance from the states. Uh, ask your retailer, who he must have a permit, whether the product you're buying comes from a guy who's got proper and adequate protection but I would tend to buy from a Quebec or Ontario tour operator. Right, so to make sure that you are protected yep. by dealing with them. Now also recently there have been some revisions to the civil code in general has how has this impacted on the whole travel contract supplier relationship? It hasn't really made a major difference for the consumer. Uh, one of the technical differences is that a retail travel agent probably now has an obligation of result, uh, which tour operators have always had. And since most people buying uh, travel are buying packages, they've always had that protection, so it hasn't really changed a lot. It changes it a bit when you're buying individual travel, uh, not part of a group tour or something like that. But for the consumer, it doesn't change a lot. Right, so it's just something that may have attracted some media attention, but really hasn't altered the relationship uh, really. that much. Now, talking about package holidays, you always see all this fine print on the back of the brochure. What does all, wading through it, it seems to be a lot of legalese, what does it really boil down to? That's one of the areas where the new civil code has changed things a lot. The, any contract must be in such language that the ordinary consumer can understand it. it that we're, thus, it has to be large enough so short-sighted guys like us uh, will be able to read it at a reasonable distance. And it should not be in such legal jargon that the ordinary consumer cannot understand it. And the test that the judge is going to apply is will an ordinary guy be able to read it and understand it and know what we're talking about? And if the ordinary guy cannot, the clause is null. Right, because in the past somebody's written fine print or it's on 
some internal page and they'll say, we'll decline responsibility because you should have read on page 47, subparagraph. That's not going to hold a lot of water in the future. Right. And also. And please, we should all remember that uh, a contract is typically the tour operator's brochure, eh? is formed of the text that is in there, but of everything else, including the pictures. Right. So if a picture shows a hotel, which looks like it's on a beach, but in reality it's separated from that beach, for instance, by a Mexican auto route, uh, <laughs> the hotel is not on the beach. Okay? And if somebody could be, uh, uh, could be if a mistaken impression can be created by a picture, that's the same misleading advertising as if it was in a text. Right, because people would see that picture and it looks like a beautiful hotel, beautiful beach, but if it's been either intentionally or not, uh, whitewashed or, look, you know, you can't really see what's going on, then of course right. that is the same. I'll as give you another example. I saw a brochure a couple of months ago uh, which showed a, a very... Uh, old city, three or four hundred years old, in one of the pictures. Right beside that, there was a text about a hotel. Any ordinary consumer would be read to believe, would be led to believe, that that hotel is somewhere near this beautiful old city. Well, a beautiful, beautiful old city is two hundred kilometers away. Okay? That's misleading advertising. Right, misleading. They didn't say that it was near the city. It was just the two. The juxtaposition of the two would lead both Stephen and Paul to believe that they're very close together. Otherwise, what's the, what's the picture doing in right, there? It's just there for like gravy or window dressing, and they really want and to make you advertising. think. And that's misleading advertising. The purpose of the brochure is to give the consumer a genuine, accurate idea of what the real story is. And if it doesn't, they got problems. And also, they have to make sure that they list in the brochure that the, all the taxes, everything that is supposed to be included is, rather than say $99, but $600 of tax. And the additions like tax, the print has to be as big as the call-in price. Right, so it's not like before you've had cases of sort of low-ball pricing and everyone will say from $99, but then you added a lot of... And it needs a magnifying glass to read the second part. Right. Okay. With that's, that's no go anymore. That's no go. No. How do they get around marking the restrictions? It's fine also to say from X, num X number of dollars, but there's always restrictions on these. How are they supposed to uh, let us as the consumer know uh, what, the restrictions, how, what are? the restrictions are. They have to be clearly stated. They have to be clearly stated saying, for instance, the dates on which those flights are available. If the, you'll see it in the papers nowadays, uh, very low prices for Paris with a departure Friday and Saturday. But it has to say when the departure is. If that is not in there, it's presumed to be all year. Right, it's presumed to be all year. It's not like go on May 1st but return on November 13th. And, right. And that, that has been the case as well. Now, are, for example, airlines, which are really a federally regulated business, are they bound as well by this type of advertising restriction? Anybody is, uh, we're dealing with two different uh, laws. One is the Travel Agents Act, uh, which is a provincial matter. Then there's the Consumer Protection Act, which is also provincial. And there are the various federal laws governing aviation. And it depends in which section they fall. Right, because a lot of times the airlines will list a price from 189, but they will not mention how much taxes... They, a, they should, uh, although in law they're not obliged to because they're not under the, uh, the Travel Agents Act. But the Consumer Protection Act, which the courts have declared applies to all the travel industry, applies to them as well. So they're not allowed to do misleading advertising either. Right. So what, for example, would be, in sort of in a general overview, the responsibilities I as a consumer, what should I be looking for, uh, but also what are my obligations and what are the obligations and responsibilities of the other side? One of the, I think, the, the, the key thing is that there is an occasional bargain around, but there are not many. Nobody should kid themselves that they're going to get the Cadillac for the price of a ladder, unless there is a very good reason. It, it, okay, mm -hmm. it, does, it occurs occasionally, but there's usually a very good reason. And if you don't know the reason, figure you're going to be getting a ladder for the price of a ladder. Right, okay? you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. There's an occasional exception. Of course, if there's a flight leaving Friday and the tour operator is sitting with 50 unsold seats, maybe on Wednesday he's going to be offering bargains. But then you'll understand because it's a 48-hour notice. You've got to leave like that. Okay? Unless there's a re and you should, if you think you're getting a bargain, you should know what the reason is why you're getting a bargain. If you don't know, be very careful.
Right. So when you're looking at that, what are also the obligations of the supplier in performing his service? Regardless of when you buy the package or buy the ticket, the obligations are the same. He's got to provide what an ordinary average consumer would understand that he's going to provide given the advertising that he's done. Okay, now in your experience, where do most problems overall tend to come in? Uh, is it from lack of performance of the supplier or simply because the consumer has not made himself aware? Okay, let's um, uh, take two different situations. One is a minor one, uh, but it's a tip for our, uh, uh, for our listeners that might be worthwhile. And it's a baggage situation. Baggage which gets delayed. 90% of the cases of delayed baggage are where you've got a connecting flight and you didn't put the, the baggage on the connecting flight yourself. That is, say that you're going to Rome via Paris. And you can, you can check your baggage right through to Rome. But in Paris, somebody's got to go to the carousel and pick your baggage up and check them onto Rome. That's where the problems occur. Tip to our listeners, if you've got a connecting flight, do the work yourself. Pick them off the carousel and recheck them on the way to Rome. Uh, it's a little bit of hassle, but a lot better than waiting three days for the baggage. In, when you're buying a package tour, uh, the problems will come from two things, basically. One is that the person, as I said before, was dreaming. They thought they're going to get the Cadillac for the latter, and you can't. The other side is when, in fact, you paid for what you should be getting, and there's a problem. Perhaps the hotel on the other end overbooked. Perhaps the tour over, uh, operator overbooked. Perhaps the tour, tour operator has been telling you a fairy tale, telling you that there's a beach when it turns out to be mud, or telling you that the hotel is on the beach, when in reality there's a road between it and the beach, and things of that type, or that the hotel is not finished. They haven't finished the renovations, which you should know. So it stems from a series of things. Two different things. Yeah. Always something. Well, glad you could join us and enlighten our viewers a little bit. Paul Underberg. Now let's drop by the travel corner for this week, see what's going on there. We'll be Hi, welcome to Travel Corner. I'm back with some travel accessories. My name's Marion Bone from Jet Setter on Laurier Street. And I've brought a few things to show you that are handy for travel, also for use when you're at home uh, around the house. This is something that we um, found for the summer, which we think is a great idea. Um, it comes as a tie very plain uh, cotton tie, but inside you can feel that there are little tiny beads and when you place this in water for 30 minutes, cold water, the beads inflate and you have a nice cool tie that you can wear around your head to keep you cool in the summer, around your neck. Uh, kids can use it when they're rollerblading. Um, we sell a lot to people who are going to Africa and to uh, Israel hot climates where they need to stay cool. This will stay nice and cold but dry on the outside to the touch for 18 hours. And if you do need a hot compress while you're traveling, we'll just place it in hot water and then you have your hot compress. It stays hot for just as long. These are um, very easy to pack once they've dried up and just put that in your suitcase. Another great uh, travel product, if you happen to get some windy or rainy weather, very easy to pack this little pouch. Doesn't weigh very much, doesn't take up much room. And when you open it up inside, you have a very handy jacket that's windproof and waterproof. And I'll just show this to you here. It comes in all sizes. You have a full zip and two pockets and a hood to protect you. Uh, very uh, lightweight and it certainly does the job when you need a, a, some protection from the rain. Speaking of protection, I've brought along a couple of um, money belts to show you. They're all different kinds on the market now. Uh, the important thing being that the one that you choose, you use. I've shown the most popular one here is a double zip money belt that you wear around your waist. Very easy to put on and uh, very easy to take off. It clips. This one here is a lightweight made of uh, nylon. But on the back side, you have a very comfortable cotton. So when it's on your skin, it uh, doesn't irritate. Completely washable. And then you have the two pockets. You can put airplane tickets, passport, identity papers, whatever it is that you need to carry. 
A second option would be this style here, where you have a loop that you put your belt through, and uh, then you just flip this into your pants. Makes it very easy and comfortable, and passport fits easily. So these are two ways that you can hide your belongings on you. Another security product here is what we call the Porta Bolt, and this can lock the door of your hotel or uh, your basement or wherever that you need security. It fits right into the door. Uh, this piece here, it's lightweight and strong, no tools to put it in, and you simply slide the bolt right up against the door, and um, there's a mechanism here that slides along, uh, and that way nobody can enter your room. These two little objects, they don't look like much, but they're very powerful. For anybody who gets um, seasickness, uh, air travel sickness, kids who are in the backseat of cars, there's no medication here. It's pure pressure that you put on your wrist, very easy to, to use. You place three fingers, and then this little button here goes right on a special point on the arm that relieves the feeling of nausea. We've sold them to pregnant women as well. So this is a handy travel item. You can keep these in the car. Uh, kids will appreciate having that around if they're feeling sick. I think I have time to show you one fast little thing here. This little object goes right into your purse, very handy. And you have a mirror on one side, and flip it open, and you can brush your hair. Very nice to take along with you, keep in your school bag, whatever is handy for you. Doesn't take up much room. Um, these here, I can show you quickly, are playing cards, little mini playing cards. If you want to uh, give them as a gift to somebody who doesn't have much room to play, they're on uh, the plane or on the tray table of a train. So these are just gives you some idea of what's available to you when you're traveling. There's lots of things around to take along. And uh, we hope you have a great trip and uh, find what you need and enjoy it. And we're back in studio with Manny Witt. He's director of the New England Tourism Center here in Montreal. Welcome to Travel World. Thank you. Now, everyone in Montreal has been most likely to New England or one of the New England mm -hmm. states at some point in time. That's right. But what is their sort of off the beaten path? I think that's what we, our viewers want to know. So why don't we do it state by state and start looking at the closest New England state to Montreal, Vermont. Vermont, okay. Vermont, the Canadians and also Quebecers are very familiar, of course, with the Stowe area. Uh, Vermont, Burlington for shopping, but there are other places in Vermont that are main attractions. Uh, we have the Northeast Kingdom, which is the northern part of Vermont, Lake Willoughby area, beautiful, beautiful place called Crystal Lake, very nice. Middlebury, Middlebury College, central Vermont. It's uh, known for the um, antique shops and the, and the uh, Frog Hollow, so forth and so on. Lake Champlain Islands, very interesting for just quiet scenery, boating, and so forth. This will take you to the Vermont. These are areas that are not normally known. Right. Now also, like, are you going to have, for example, do you know whether the Green Mountain Flyer train will still be running this year? Bellows Falls. Right. Right. Bellows right. Falls sure, to sure. Chester. And I mean, yeah. that's a very scenic the ride southern, through the, that's through southern the sort Vermont. of southeast. Yeah, we, call, we, we, count, we classify Vermont as three basic areas, northern, central, and southern. So, southern holds the, like you said, Bellows Falls, Mount Snow for skiing, Bennington and Brattleboro areas not known for Quebec tourism. More, more New York, more um, uh, Massachusetts will follow that area. Right, they'll come up the Connecticut River Valley. Sure. And another place that sort of struck me as being very unique, and it's a little town like White River Junction. Oh, right? yeah. You wouldn't think of turning off White River Junction, but the Hotel Crossroads. Coolidge, Hotel Coolidge downtown is a very yeah, nice Hotel dining Coolidge, room. Hotel Coolidge, that's right. Very important stop for Quebecers going down to Massachusetts. They, they stop at White River Junction. If you notice, that area's been built up more and more over the years with uh, Canadian promotions. Canadian, there's a good radis on there that offers Canadian uh, funds. Uh, major, major um, hockey stop for the kids that go down there. That's where the buses stop. Right, the Radisson, which is actually in Lebanon, New Hampshire. It's the, Lebanon, yeah. Right, right yeah, on, right right off, on the yeah. border. We right consider up, White River in Lebanon. They consider themselves as one, yeah. as one city. So now they get into New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and what would you suggest they see? Canadians, Quebecers, very familiar with North Conway shopping, very familiar with, with um, the White Mountains, with the Mount Washington Valley. What they're not familiar with is Lakes Region. 
Lake Winnipesaukee. Very interesting area. Uh, good market. Um, there's a great store. Uh, matter of fact, as you mentioned, going down to New Hampshire, going down to the Massachusetts coast, it's called Bainham's New England Mercantile. Great stop, New London, New Hampshire. Right, and they had a lot of unique merchandise oh, there, as I remember. Something just incredible. You, things you wouldn't normally even expect to see ever in a retail setting, and you wonder, what, what are these mm -hmm. things? But they're there, and it's a real... They have special buyers that go all over the world just to find unique items. Right. Great so, stuff. Again, that's something unique. And another area I like in New Hampshire, it's in the southwest corner, Keene, New Hampshire. Keene, New Hampshire. Keene. Yeah, Keene, New Hampshire. Big university. Yeah, big university there, yeah. and the Ashalot River winding through through town, That's very right. picturesque, and it's real small town New England, but again with the major hotels sure. and, and restaurants. So, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, great state to to visit as well. Mm -hmm. Montrealers head to Maine. Now, there must be more to Maine than just going to the beach. There is there there is a coalition that we work with called the Southern Maine Coast, Wells, York, Kittery, Ogonquit, um, Old Orchard Beach, and what are, and Kennebunk. Those are very familiar, of course, with Quebecers. There are other areas in Maine. I, I'm sure many of your, your viewers have not been to Northern Maine. Moose moose tours, great idea. Just started last year, and they're completely sell out. They take you on a moose. To, uh, they guarantee you moose sightings. Uh, just like you go whale watching, they'll guarantee you that. It's very interesting. That's out of Berlin. It's called the Northern White Mountains region. Uh, Franconia. I mean, these are areas that are not normally visited. Right, that whole area is sort of like Jackman, Maine, yeah, yeah. Uh, that whole yeah, area. Right, okay. That's more sort of mm -hmm. north of even oh, the Canadian okay, right. yeah, Jackman, Maine, that whole area. Okay. Massachusetts, there's a whole whole story to be done on yeah. Massachusetts. And I know later uh, in this season, um, Peter Sovey will be dropping by talking about the north of Boston area. Okay. But again, there's Boston, so much to see there. It's a cultural city, well, historical city. Boston and Cape Cod are the two, I guess, the two major points for Quebecers and going down there. Uh, but, but the Berkshires, Tanglewood, unknown. Uh, big, big market for United, within the United States. But uh, Tanglewood is, is an exceptionally beautiful scenic area uh, to visit. Um, Springfield, the Big E, the New England's largest exposition for 17 days is in September. Um, it is so unique and massive, ma massive, uh, something that people should be visiting. It's right on the 91, uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. Oh, okay, Good so area. they just go the uh, 89 down to the 91. Right to 91, and it's right and there. Straight down, and straight Chicopee down. Chicopee and uh, Holyoke and so forth. Now, program Massachusetts has been advertising also savings. Sensational savings. There are about 200 and odd um, hotels and attractions that are giving uh, Canadian APAR, Canadian discounts, and so forth and so on. Off-season rates, uh, stay, stay for three days, pay for two, stay for five, stay, pay for three, and so forth like that. And uh, this is in effect right now, oh, okay. right through the end of October. Right through the end of October. So uh, would some of the properties have blackout dates during the... Yeah. They would have some blackout dates. So Probably really the last two weeks in July or so forth. Right, the busiest time. So it's mm -hmm. basically best to get the flyer June. and then plan around because mm -hmm. that's actually one of the great times to mm -hmm. visit New England before the crowds. Absolutely. Do it in the spring mm -hmm. and, the, and the fall. A bit nice times. Um, New England's high season is actually uh, from August 15th. Yeah, well, you get the water. Oh, the water warms it's much warmer, up, yeah. warms up off the coast, mm. and then also you do big business fall foliage. Oh, that that's is. Connecticut and Vermont, and Connecticut holds a very big fall fall, fall foliage season. Right, right. and uh, of course Vermont and uh, Rhode Island. Rhode Island is. We didn't cover Rhode Island, but Rhode Island has two areas there: Blackstone Valley, French heritage tours. Blackstone Valley is, I think, forty percent of the homeowners there are from French uh, origin. Right, and that's something a lot of people don't realize as well. Uh, first of all, they think Rhode Island, there's not, not much to mm. do there, but it is sort of a real, as a state, an undiscovered state amongst the six. Mm. It's the one that is often o overlooked. That's right. I can keep you there for two weeks and you'll still have plenty to do. Okay, now also we touched upon the um, the French heritage in New England, that's sometimes also overlooked. Also cities like Lowell in Massachusetts, Manchester, Manchester New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Of course, Blackstone Valley. There's several areas in uh, Blackstone. Even Newport has a has a, a French community within itself, and, and it's still a vibrant community. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Montrealers would maybe perhaps mm -hmm. like to go down mm -hmm. and discover their heritage and parts of their yep. parts of their family. Definitely. And I guess the last state then in our 
six-day tour would be Connecticut. Mm -hmm. People are familiar with Mystic. Mystic Seaport, Mystic Pizza, which, so forth and that. But there are definitely other areas. Waterbury region, famous, the brass capital of the world, Waterbury. Um, Housatonic Valley, um, bed and breakfasts, antique shops, galore. It's a different culture than Vermont, but, it's, it's, it, but it still has the enormous variety of bed and breakfasts and, and, and smaller inns. It has a beautiful shoreline. Stonington, many, many movies are made of there many, many types of uh, different movies. Okay, now we're also, you mentioned bed and breakfast. People go to New England. Again, we, t you know, in our intro to the program, we mentioned, you know, uh, elegance and, mm -hmm. and inns. I mean, we don't, we don't, don't want to knock them, but I mean, we can stay in a chain hotel sure. in, in any part of the country. Mm -hmm. What would be some of your selections, some of your picks that are sort of must-sees if you're touring in New England? Uh, for bed and breakfast, as you're bed talking about. Bed and breakfast right? or yeah. hotels in general. Goodness, there I, there's so many different types of, of, of bed and breakfasts. It's hard to pick out the certain ones, but I can tell you, I can feature them around attractions, which I would say to stay around. It's, in, in Vermont, I would say the Shelburne Museum and stay around that area. There are beautiful bed and breakfasts. Go to the Foxwoods Casino in Cassette, Connecticut. Right two minutes from there, you have the Days Inn, Hilton, many, many hotels that you can stay for $49, $59 a night. Um, there are uh, even in the Cape, you'll have to be able to find, um, matter of fact, some Quebecers have bought properties down there, which they're selling at $59, uh, small in, inns and, and manors that they've reconverted into bed and breakfasts. It's really hard to say. There's so many. I mean, we have over 600 bed and breakfasts listed just in the, in, in the state of Maine. Right. So mm -hmm. really, you could plan your whole tour around mm -hmm. staying in yeah, unique you could. inns, bed yeah. and breakfast. We could, you could. There's uh, no. There's no problem with those. They, they range anywhere from thirty to from. I mean, we've seen some as eighteen dollars a night up to you can stay at a bed and breakfast in downtown Boston for one hundred and fifty-five dollars a night per person. Right. So, so it's. Um, it basically depends on the market, market. Depends on the time of the year, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, where would somebody they want information on New England? What would they to get uh, the information for this time of year? They can call our office in Montreal if, uh, if it's a local Montreal uh, number. Should I give the number? Seven three. Yeah, give it to us. Seven three one forty eight ninety eight. Oh, okay. Seven three one forty eight ninety eight, and that's a New England tourist office. And you can provide them with all the information yeah. if their appetite we'll send is it up being by mail the next day. wet on this show. Well, thank you very much, Manny, no for problem. joining us. Uh, thank thank you. all of you for joining us. It's been a pleasure once again. I'm Stephen Pickford from all of us here. Till next time, happy traveling. Thank you.